Hey, it's Val and Mike, and a new movie opening in theaters today that I know a lot of us here locally know a lot about, and that's yeah. Saturday's Warrior. We have a special guest in studio. This is the director of the film, Michael Buster. Welcome. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We're excited about this new version of Saturday's Warrior. So let's go through the history of Saturday's Warrior. It was Killer. a play back in the 70s. Yeah, 1974. Back and, and in a Studio City, California. And it's set in the 70s, and your film is still set in the 70s. Yeah, and that only made sense because, I mean, there was a lot of discussion in the beginning of, like, do we modernize this? And uh, it, it basically, what we ended up deciding was that the whole crux of the issue of zero population that was kind of a big deal back then with Ehrlich's book, we just thought, you know, nobody's talking about that now. And so if we suddenly try to, like, put it in today's clothes and still talk about zero population, it's like, this, this makes no sense. So we decided that to go back there would make it, I think, kind of cooler and retro and also make it timeless. Yeah. Like, I think you watch a movie like, uh, 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 what was I thinking of? Hairspray. You watch Hairspray, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hairspray has a certain time and place that it takes place in with segregation and things. And it just it, makes sense. That it if you couldn't to, take place No, you do it now and yeah. it's like, well, people won't dance together? Like, what? <laughs> I don't understand. Black and white people can't dance together? So it was kind of a very similar idea for us. We just figured, keep it in the 70s. But then we did have to update it in tone. In, in storyline, I mean, we changed quite a bit okay. uh, to make it, I feel like, more relevant and also um, kind of cut down on some of the cheesy factor that I think a lot of people sort of... I don't of... know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm only, I have only seen the 1989 version video. of uh-huh. the video on VHS, so I've never seen the musical, uh, like Mike I've knows all is, the words. All I've seen so. is the live production that happened in the early 80s, which right. Made, Saw probably 30 or 40 times because I was doing the sound for the production of it, and I've discovered today that I still know all the songs. I discovered yeah. that as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we apologize for that. So in today's film world and making a film where you're not a big major studio, mm-hmm. what are the struggles with getting the film out there and getting it seen? Well, yeah. Uh, so well, one, we've got a great distributor, so I'm super thrilled about that. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest struggle is just making sure that your audience is aware of it. Right. Um, and, and I think the greatest thing about Saturday's Warrior has always been the fans of the show. They, they've always made this thing what it is. Uh, and, and I feel like they've made it uh, something that people really care about and it means a lot to them. And so for us, like, you know, this opening weekend is our opportunity for an audience to come and really get uh, the, the rest of the world an opportunity to see it. Basically what happens to here this weekend for us is, uh, is the opportunity for the film to go everywhere. Um, and, and, and our distributors had a pretty good track record at this of helping like that opening weekend be really big and then the trade papers start paying attention and they're like, wait, what was this little movie that, that did all this big business? Now, and, do you uh, struggle with being pigeonholed as a Mormon movie? Sure, there's that. Um, and, and, you know, we didn't try to totally shy away from that. Saturday's Warrior is Saturday's Warrior. Right. Um, the key for us was to make it a little less black and white, to make it a little less uh, religion-centric. I so felt it's like, a little more just family yeah, oriented. Yeah, yeah, completely. It's just about family. It's about people. Th- th- you know, I didn't want anybody to get a free ride in the film. And so in the original, it was kind of like parents good, Jimmy bad, <laughs> Jimmy's friends bad, you know? And so in this one, it's really like, no, Jimmy's kind of his own worst enemy. Jimmy's friends are good people. They just have a different set of values than he's got. Okay. Um, and Jimmy's Very parents. Very relatable. Yeah, you know, and Jimmy's parents, even though they're kind of doing what I think some people might think, like, hey, this is what we're all supposed to do. Um, they, there's also consequences for the choices they make. And, and uh, so everybody, we just complicated everybody. Okay. And made it a lot more, I think, real. Okay. So tell us a little bit about uh, the cool actors that you have in the film. They're phenomenal. Making a musical is a little more difficult than making a regular film because you have singing and you have dancing and you have big productions. Yeah, so uh, this is where I leaned on. So my wife is a casting director. I don't know if anybody is aware of that. She uh, she actually won an Emmy for Band of Brothers. Oh, wow. She worked on that. She worked on my Big Fat Greek Wedding. She did a lot of things when we lived in Los Angeles. And so I really leaned on her to kind of help me understand like what these actors would be capable of uh, on the big screen. She's really good at that. Um, and, and so it was just kind of meeting everybody and getting a sense. What we really wanted to cast people the actual ages they were playing. You know, those times where mm, you see that 30-year-old okay. woman playing an right. 18-year-old? Yeah. And you're kind of like, eh, okay, yeah. Not believable. All right, you know, or, or you'll see these movies with missionaries and they're receding hairlines and <laughs> stuff, and you're just kind of like, well, okay. Uh, and I believe me, I've gone through that. I was in God's Army. I was in the, like, the first one, and I was a few years older than what I was playing, so I get it. But we really were trying to let it be as real as possible, and so we cast a lot of relative unknowns. Huh. And so in the casting process, it was really me pushing them to see, like, what are you capable of? What can you do? I could not have been more thrilled 
with what we got out of these performers. Kenny Holland, uh, who is a big YouTube sensation, he has like 8 million followers online. Uh, he is incredible in this film. I mean, I, I'm telling you, we've, we found a star. Hmm. He's just amazing. And, and, and is, was he, do we have a lot of local cast from Utah in the film? We do. It's mostly local. Yeah. I mean, we have some people from St. George, but they're mostly people who live here in the area. And they were all people who I hadn't really previously seen before. Um, and they're, they're incredible. But the nice thing is, is that you don't like look at them and be like, oh yeah, him from this and that and this right. and that and that. Like they are all kind of who, who they are. And the audience gets to really experience them and feel them as a like family. Yeah, I like that. Too. Um, did, would, did you film the production here locally? Where was it made? We were we made it here and in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, because oh, cool. I mean, no other place was the center of counterculture than San Francisco, <laughs> uh, and we really wanted Jimmy to sort of be pulled by you know his family's culture and the counterculture, hmm. and and to let him you know realize that the stuff that his parents are doing isn't really that cool, and we wanted the audience to feel that pull where he's like, not really vibing with them. I mean, one of the differences we made is he's actually like a musician. Okay. Uh, and so he's, his parents are kind of doing this Partridge family sort of thing, which is not cool at all. Um, and then he's got these friends in a counterculture band who are like, let's, let's make some real music. Like, let's, let's do this. And he is pulled. And then the audience can feel like, well, yeah, I can see why he wants to go. Right. Um, you know, I can see why in the parents. And so you, you talked about daddy's nose, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, way back when. So we cut the song because the song is cheesy. Yeah, completely. <laughs> but we thought it would be fun to have the dad continue to try to pitch to the kids this idea for a song that they should do. And so the dad's oh, trying okay. to sell them on this, like, hey, wouldn't it be great? And then they're like, not no. Great. Not so much. <laughs> like, that's not cool. It's not funny. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we play a little bit with the original. So this sounds like a movie that is definitely family friendly, something you can take kids to, but yep. not so sugary sweet that, you know, if, if you're not a member of the LDS church, this is something you could still enjoy for sure. It totally. Like. Yeah. This is just a prodigal son story. Okay. And, and we use, I mean, Mormonism is sort of the, 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 the culture in which it's based, but it's not something where it's like, it's, it's not making any truth claims. It's just, this is the culture. It's very much, if you think like Fiddler on the Roof or these other things where you're, you're indulged the in the culture, yeah. but nobody's trying to convert anybody to anything. Okay. It's yeah. just like, here's the story, here's his family, this family believes this, and Jimmy's trying to figure out where he fits in this world. Well, we're looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. Definitely. Saturday's where you're opening this weekend. In theaters all along the Wasatch Front? Yep, everywhere, pretty much, all up and down. Michael, thank you for coming in. We appreciate you having yeah, you here. Yeah, it was nice to meet you guys.